Uh, our keynote this year is Chris Bari from Studio Tendril. Uh, they are a design-driven animation, VFX, and digital innovation studio in Toronto and Sao Paulo. He is the co-founder, artist, and director of the studio, um, and they all often look towards pushing the boundaries of visual storytelling. Uh, today, he's going to take you through Tendril's creative design and story development process for communicating complex stories, which I'm sure we can all relate to. And he's going to delve into some recent work uh, that he did for Microsoft, Visio, Ecobee, and more. Um, so, yeah, Chris, come on down. Well, um, thanks a lot for having me here. It's a, it's a real, um, real pleasure. Um, in, you know, uh, we're not directly in this community, but um, in spirit, I feel like we're, we're sort of all in the same world of design and visual communication. And, um, and in particular, let me see, how, how can I advance the slides here? Can I use the, uh, the keyboard? Oop. Ah, there we go. So, as was mentioned, my name is Chris Bari. I'm a creative director and one of the co-founders of Tendril Studio here in Toronto. And um, I, uh, I have uh, I've had a lifelong love affair with uh, with the sciences and the arts. Um, my sweet spot is um, is right in that place where art and design and science cross over. This is. Uh, this is an old photograph from back in the 80s. It's my parents' basement. Apparently, I was growing bacterial cultures down there and, <laughs> and then making illustrations of their various growth processes. My, um, my mom's a, a professor of film, or was, she's retired now, film and literature, and thank you very much. And, uh, and my dad was, uh, was in the sciences and also taught, uh, taught the sciences. And, um, and for a while, uh, he, he actually taught at the Science Center, and I'd be there kind of assisting him in his lectures. And one of the, one of the demos back then was there was a, a full-scale um, preserved human digestive system, and I would take uh, one part of the one end of the, the long intestine and go across the room, and he'd be holding the other end, and uh, we'd be demonstrating the scale of the thing to the audience. It's pretty weird, but uh, <laughs> that's my background. And, I've, uh, I've carried that through uh, my entire life. I'm, uh, w I did study here at U of T many years ago. It was kind of a mishmash of biology, linguistics, literature. And, um, but I creeped out the, the um, engineering library back then, and that's when the bug really bit me. I, I discovered some of these books that I'm sure uh, some of you are also familiar with as well. It was uh, right at the cusp of early computer graphics. And it totally opened my mind to the idea that there were, um, there were all these underlying mathematical principles and, and uh, um, behind these, these natural forms that I was completely in love with. And it, it opened my eyes to the idea that through, um, th that we could use those, those, um, those mathematical frameworks to, as a design tool to create art and to, to express things. And so when I'm not busy at the studio, which isn't very often, I like to make things like this. I'm really into fractals and, um, and natural forms and looking at ways to, to generate them procedurally. Stuart, and it sounds like others, talked a little bit about uh, Houdini and some of those procedural tools. And I'll talk a little bit about how we use those at the studio as well. And, uh, and so that's all, all, all just to say that my heart is with you guys. I'm, um, I really, uh, I'm not a scientist, and what we do is certainly not science at Tendril, but, um, but we're inspired by, by, um, by the natural world and all these processes, and we pull a lot of that inspiration into the work we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I wanted to talk uh, with you guys today about a little, uh, um, are, are kind of two pieces. It, it's really just you know what? 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 Uh, you know what? What makes the, the studio tick? What, how does Tendril work? Uh, is everyone here familiar with Tendril or the work we do? A little bit. That's great. I'm not going to uh, play a whole bunch of our work or a reel because that's all on the website. I wanted to get a little bit more into the process, and uh, and I, I was you know it was really nice to go through this because I had to really think through a little bit more. Um, you know what does make the, the studio tick. 
And I kind of whittled it down to, on the one hand, uh, the environment itself and this kind of collaborative place we've created for ourselves to create and do the work we do. And then on the other hand, there, there is a methodology. There is a kind of a consistent thread in the way we approach the work we do with our clients. And I wanted to, uh, to provide a little bit of insight into that as well. It's a question that often comes up, man. How do you, how do you guys do that? What is the, what, what's the way you even begin to, to approach some of that kind of work? So in a nutshell, uh, Tendril is a design-driven animation, visual effects, and digital innovation studio. It's a mouthful, but um, it really does capture the essence of what we do. We say design-driven because there's, uh, there's a real process, uh, an iterative process and collaborative process uh, in our work. We, say, um, we like to say that we use design to communicate complex stories. I'm sure um, that's something very familiar to, to you here, all of you as well, that uh, the stories you have to communicate, I would say, would have a tendency to be even much more complex than the ones we have to tell. And, um, and we get people excited about the possibilities of the near future. And that's because uh, you know, a lot of the work we do and that we've done over the years has been uh, visual communication with and for brands, various different kinds of brands. We worked for many years with Nike on, uh, on upcoming product launches. We've worked with a lot of technology brands and companies in various different ways. And, um, and quite often, the work we do is centered around a product launch something that hasn't yet uh, come into realization in, in the world or, or that's still in development, or maybe we're providing a vision uh, of something that, that's still sort of evolving and coming to be. So back to what makes the studio tick. If we, it, when, when we discuss this internally, we kind of whittle it down to, to these three basic things, diversity, chemistry, and passion. They're sort of like the fundamental ingredients to, to, to what, you know, what, what provide the basic tools for, for the studio to, to kind of do the work it does. There, um, there's a tremendous diversity of, uh, of culture at the studio. We speak over 14 languages. There are artists um, within the studio here in Toronto from all around the world. And, uh, and then, uh, as was mentioned, we have a little studio down in Brazil because um, my uh, co-founder and partner, Alexandre, is, is Brazilian. And beyond that, we have many collaborators we, we pull in from around the world that work with us in various different capacities. And, uh, and it's, not just, uh, it's not just the diversity, it's, it's like the right kind of diversity. We really believe that if you, if you take the right people with the right intentions and kind of bind them together with, with some kind of a common purpose, that really good things are going to happen. And, uh, and none of the stuff I'm, I'm showing you I can take credit for. It's really all, it's, it's due to all these uh, incredible people at the studio that come in and bring all of their passions to the table. And it's really like a joy for me um, as the co-founder to walk in every day and, uh, and see all of the great work that's happening. It's, it's the biggest gift back to me that I could have ever imagined uh, in founding a studio has been to be you know, inspired um, to, to continue doing what I want to do by the people that, that are around me. And everyone at the studio is creative, uh, a creative soul. This is very, very important. Um, every single person, no matter what role they play at the studio, whether they're an artist or a producer or a coordinator, uh, lives a kind of a creative life and, uh, and, pour, and pour a ton of passion into their own work every single day. And that inspiration and that passion that they pull from the world out in, out in the world, they bring back in. And, um, and it creates this kind of vibe and energy that, that, that is essential to, to, to what we do. And, it, and, and there's a lot of care and love in that work. And there's also uh, something we've, we've worked really hard to foster is a, an environment where there is a lot of, um, it's kind of like a safe place uh, for critique where there's a lot of, there's a mutual understanding that we're all just there to try to make really great work together. And, um, and that means that, it's, that if someone is, is approaching you or wants to discuss an idea, there's a lot of openness there because there's a, there's a mutual respect and understanding that the intentions behind that are in service of making the work better. Everyone's there to, to, 
to collaborate and make work better. And I guess the point I'm, I'm trying to make here is that the work we do is, um, it, and, and everything about the studio is a, is a very collaborative environment. So everything from the space to the people to the mix of things is in service of fostering collaboration, fostering this sort of like, you know, constant flow of ideas and, um, and exchange between people. So I wanted to spend um, a little bit of time talking about some of the work we've been doing lately over the past few years with Microsoft specifically which has been a surprising and exciting reward because uh, Microsoft, of course, traditionally uh, is not known uh, for its design culture, but rather for its engineering culture. They, they make incredible software uh, that you know, millions of people around the world use every day. Uh, our, studio, our, uh, our machines at the studio all run Windows, in fact. And, um, and of course, you know, the Office softwares are something that, um, that many of us maybe use in various capacities as well. And, uh, and so with Microsoft, initially we weren't working on any kind of brand work or, or brand communication work. It all started out with uh, a lot of experimental work around the HoloLens specifically and AR experiences. And we got to know them a little bit through those channels. We, uh, we visited the campus out in Seattle and spoke with various different individuals. And for us, that, uh, that process of kind of getting under the hood with people and really meeting the engineers behind the, behind the work is, um, is something we have found uh, is, a, is a really good entry point into the work to really kind of lay the foundations of research, to spend time like getting under the hood, getting to know the people, getting to know um, their motivations and what, what's going on. Uh, with this particular set of projects, the the, um, the challenge was to find a really exciting and new and beautiful way to visualize the software. And that hadn't been done before, and we didn't really know where to begin. So this page here uh, up behind me, it, it, shows, it shows the kind of what, what we found that, that formed the basis for how we, how we could even think about beginning to approach this. So on the one hand, um, on the left, uh, we noticed that there was a bit of a kind of a, after all, a bit of a design revolution happening over there at Microsoft. The, the service products and the hardware products that they had been developing are extremely beautifully conceived. They're, they're engineered in, the, uh, in, a, in a very um, elegant way. They're, they're very tactile products. They incorporate materials that are soft. There's, um, there's a lot of emphasis in the visual communication around the experience of like, of, um, of handling the, the hardware and the way it kind of tilts and moves. It, it's very experiential and very sensory. And as you can see from those images, the, the visual communication is also very elegant and very minimal on the surface and very controlled. So that was the hardware side of things. And then on the software side of things, there was also something really exciting brewing and it wasn't yet public but we were able to dig under the hood a little bit and there were little hints of it here and there and one of the most exciting hints was something called uh, fluent design that they were developing internally and that's that uh, those icons you see there uh, on the right in the middle they had uh, Microsoft and the team of people uh, there had conceived of these five principles uh, and you can see this a little blurry I'm sorry it's a very small image but they are um, light depth, motion, material, and scale. And they're, they're these abstract con concepts, but they're, they're these underlying visual principles that define the interactions and the visual look of the user interfaces that they've been developing and re-engineering. And just to, to rewind it a little bit, the whole project was centered around the redesign of all of the office software. So if you've had a look at it lately, it's all been completely overhauled and it's very elegant. It's very beautiful. It's all cloud-based. It's all driven by um, a very powerful AI engine. But on the surface, it's very clean. It's very minimal and the user experience is frictionless and very transparent. And, um, and so when we saw this, when we saw Fluent Design and some of the conceptual thinking behind that, 
and looked at the hardware, we could see there was a lot of synergy between those two things. There are a lot of similarities and overlaps. And that, that allowed us to kind of, it was, that was our hook. That was our, our kicking off point. We had something that we could, we could hinge on. So as with any big complex communication challenge, the best way to approach it is to break it down into smaller and more manageable chunks. And we do this very collaboratively. We have a lot of um, workshoppy kind of conversations and, uh, and brainstorms together. And the very, very first kick at the can at this one was distilling down the problem into a set of guide rails based on what we had seen in that research and those conversations we were having. And uh, so for one, we knew that whatever we were going to create visually, it needed to be very sensory, very tactile, because everything we had seen was indeed very, very much uh, about the experience, the sensory experience. On the other hand, uh, because there were some very specific communication objectives, we needed to define some kind of a very clear and universal visual language. Microsoft's audience is, as you might imagine, very large, all kinds of age groups. So this had to be a very easy and digestible um, communication strategy. But at the same time, we wanted it to be very exciting and contemporary and different. We're always trying to look for, for a way to, to buck the trend and be, be fresh in what we do. Uh, another thing we really wanted to employ was, and it's in the, the, the software itself, was the idea of light and moving light and animating light. And then lastly, we wanted to expose the grid. There was a, a kind of an inherent beauty in the grid underlying all of this software design. And they had shared some of that with us. And we felt that it would be a kind of a nice um, nod to all of the engineering and all of that kind of culture of engineering and bring it into design. To, uh, it, it's a, it, it was a nice, we thought it would be a very nice way to, to, um, to just uh, acknowledge all of the thinking behind the software design. So with those guide rails in mind, the next step for us is, is kind of going through these different phases. And it, it's very iterative and it's a process. Again, this is not science at all. It's very intuitive. It's a process that works for us. And I looked through a lot of our back catalog of projects and I found that this is indeed a very common thread. And we do, we do follow this process in, with variations on every single project we do. So there's something about it that seems to work. But um, these first two things are kind of the critical pieces. So story beats on the one hand, and this idea of a kind of a sandbox discovery phase where we allow people space and time to explore and, um, and test the boundaries. So the story beats. In this case, we, um, there were these um, specific communication objectives. There were, uh, there were new, there, you know, very nuts and bolts things. There were um, specifically the new icons themselves, uh, the idea of the kind of fluidity of the experience encapsulated in the word speed. The ribbon is this um, user interface element that's common across all the software at the top of the software. The idea of collaboration was very important because it's a cloud-based software. It was a, you know, very sim similar to what Google has done with, uh, with Google Drive, but this was Microsoft's first endeavor at uh, approaching that. And we really wanted to find an interesting way to show that multiple people can be working in these softwares at the same time collaboratively. Uh, the iconography within the apps uh, themselves and then uh, that, all of that is on the surface, that kind of fluid surface experience. And then underlying all of that is this, was this idea of uh, what they call at Microsoft the substrate, this, um, this very sophisticated technology, cloud-based AI that, um, that facilitates things like AI search engines and a lot of really powerful features that are, that are there under the hood. But, um, but that we wanted to make sure came across as facilitating the simplicity of the experience rather than complicating it. So this is a, an excerpt from the story beats we did develop at the beginning of the project. And you can see that 
those, um, those chapters I just mentioned were the way the film was structured. At this point in the process is where we're able to start really sandboxing and exploring. So the idea behind this is to provide what we call uh, freedom within a framework for the team. Everyone on the team has a distinct personality, different skills, different areas of interest. And when a project like this lands on the table and we start breaking it down, we need to provide some kind of a, a scaffolding for everyone to latch onto and begin their process of exploration and design. And, and so that's what the story beats provide. And uh, this, this sandboxing process for us is important because, and here's a, this is a process video actually. I guess it has audio, I'll let it play through, but this is just to show some of the kind of exploration that goes on under the hood. A large portion of the work ends up in the dustbin and we have to be okay with that. We have to be okay with letting things go if they don't quite fit and also at the same time staying open to new ideas that may be a better fit than what we came up with at the beginning. So some of our favorite things that we created are not in the final product, but they're part of the process and they might come back later in another project or they may have just fed into another idea that someone else had. Sorry, I didn't realize that little guy was there the whole time. Um, so yeah, freedom, freedom within a framework is a really important concept for us at the studio. They, on the back of that project, which was uh, specifically for the Ignite conference in 2018, which was the unveiling of, the first kind of unveiling of this new office redesign, we, um, we moved on to the next project, which which evolved things a little bit in a, uh, further in a, in a little bit of a different direction. This one specifically was uh, the, the, uh, a film created to reveal the new icons. And this, uh, this film specifically centered more around the idea, even deeper around that idea of the grid and the craftsmanship underlying, uh, underlying the icons themselves, treating them, you know, they, they, there was a, it was incredible to see how much thinking and design had gone into them. And on face value, you know, the icons are very beautiful, but, um, but we wanted to expose all of the, again, all of the thought that had gone into that. And here, as you can see again, is our, our initial kick at the can with story beats. This film had, um, had a voiceover, which provided a little bit of a framework. So we developed a very kind of simple script uh, that described the process of these new icons evolving and changing through, um, through the years into what they were now. And, uh, and as you can see, we do, we do uh, beyond, there, there are mood boards here, but you can see also there are these little thumbnail storyboards. Uh, but th as you can see, they're very rudimentary. So this kind of goes back to that idea again of providing some kind of guide rails, some kind of initial framework, but always leaving openness for exploration. And it's also important for the artists too. Any artist on a team, any, um, any creator, and everybody here I'm sure is a creator, needs room to breathe. It's not much, um, it's not very exciting or too much fun if things are overly defined from the get-go. And also, we rob ourselves of the most exciting part of the process by doing that, which is the discovery phase, the exploratory phase. It's, um, it's something that is exciting, and, and it's the best part of the project. And so we, we're always kind of treading this fine line of needing to articulate the idea enough that we can move the project forward and the clients can understand where we're going, but leaving room for it to breathe and leaving room for it to change. And it sounds scary sometimes to have, you know, that things could change, that, uh, you know, the communication strategy could change. But the reason we do this is because that better idea is always lurking around the corner. We have to go deeper and, and go that little bit, ex you know, that little extra step beyond the, the initial instinct. How am I doing for time? Am I, I hope I'm not rambling on, okay. Um, 
So this is just a cross section to show a demonstration of that. The, the, there's a, a very large breadth of uh, visual exploration that happens um, across form, shape, color, and, but it's all within that design language. And we do that, it's, it does run a little bit parallel path to the development, the beginning of the development of the edit and the animatic. But, um, but we do at the outset spend time defining visuals in a, very, um, in a very clear way. And it kind of serves as a bit of a, a signpost for us later on. There's, um, the, th this was something that, that, uh, that felt like a really good way to explain this. There's, everyone knows about the kind of ugly phase of a project, the animatic. You know, we're always afraid, you know, when we see that first edit or when we first show the client. It's, it's it, you know, it, can, it has to, the work we do, this 3D work is very laborious and very time consuming. And so one way we can kind of get ourselves through the ugly phase is by taking that time at the beginning to develop those beautiful visuals and have them serve as kind of like a, a beacon later on that we can always look back to and we can always point and say, don't worry, you know, it's gonna look like that. We're gonna get there. It's just a really sl long, slow climb back up that hill to get to that finished, polished result, which involves all the craft uh, that we know well. Um, and what have I got here? I'm not sure, let's see. This is, this is an animatic, actually. So this is a bit of the ugly phase of, um, of the ICONS project specifically. So you can see that process of design and all of those style frames and the, the, the noodling sketches and the animatic camera tests, they provide us with a toolkit. And we try to create as big of a toolkit as possible that we can feed into that edit and sort of cobble things together and test things out and experiment with something different and we'll even bounce the edit around. Sometimes one of us will start the edit and then it's in a common place on the server and someone else can open that edit and try something else out and see if it works. And, uh, and that, uh, that, that process, again, is very iterative and very free. But it allows us and affords us that possibility to, get, to go that, that level deeper and find something new and fresh. So, yeah, you, you can see, and I'll play the final piece after this, and you'll see the differences. This was sort of, that animatic we just watched, sort of a middle phase one. There would, there would be an even earlier one before that with just static boards sometimes. And this is the final film f for that icon's launch here. Office is evolving, becoming simpler, more collaborative more powerful. Its icons are evolving too, into a visual language that reflects the powerful simplicity and harmony of the office apps. Unique symbols that adapt to their context across platforms, across devices, It's a new look at color, lighter, more vibrant hues, but still so familiar. A connected visual system that speaks to a faster, more intelligent, frictionless experience. Designed to reflect the more connected, collaborative way we work today. It's the look of the new office. So, you know, allowing to all, thanks. Thanks, for that. thanks for that. Um, Just think of all those amazing people I showed you earlier. Um, so, you know, allow, allow things to take shape. Stay open-minded to change. The best idea is just a little further. Um, and and we go really far. This is a project we just finished. And as you can see, there are even more explorations on this one. We're, we're always trying to push it a level further. This was something we just finished creating for uh, a product called Yammer, which is like a, an enterprise class Facebook news feed, so to speak, that is built for organizations to work with internally for communications, kind of like 
yeah, like Slack and Facebook fused together for very large organizations. And, um, and in this case, what we wanted to do was develop things and push things a little further into a, even, an, an even more tactile space because it's all about, uh, it was all about communication through pages and paper. We came up with the idea of using very tactile pages and paper. Still incorporating that acrylic that you see in those previous films and building on that visual language of the others, but just taking it a little bit of a step further. And it was only possible to do that because we had that base to build on from the previous films. And, uh, and again here, this is an excerpt from the guidelines developed at the very outset of the project. And you can see they follow that model again very closely. There are some thumbnails that articulate visual communication of specific story points. In this case, there were some software interactions that had to be uh, described and shown in an animated fashion. So you can see up here, the, uh, that, that's the beat. The story beats are much, um, much more detailed because of that. But, um, but then, you know, underlying there's, you know, there are some loose kind of uh, guidelines and guideposts and ideas, but then a lot of room to explore. And uh, I pulled this GIF just to, just to share a little window into how much, um, and it's kind of segues into the next little bit about the, the environment that exists around these uh, products and things we're creating. In the shot, you'll see, I think I have the film in here, in the, maybe I don't, but if it, you'll see the shot is just a little, it's, a, it's like a five second shot of the close up moment of that paper kind of unfolding. But the entire environment exists there. And one thing that we've been doing over the past few years is always thinking about the environment within which these products and these experiences exist. So they don't live inside of a void. It's um, a bit of a kind of a world building exercise for us to think in this way. I do think I do have it maybe here. We'll see. There it is, yeah. I'm gonna play through. But you'll see a little bit of an evolution from the past. That was it. That was that shot. <laughs> so that little, little tidbit. Yeah. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of story beats, a lot of story building, a lot of, um, a lot of like thinking and, you know, deconstruction and um, intellectual meditation around those things. But actually, you know, then we throw all of that out the window because ultimately what we really need to do is find the emotional resonance underlying these things. And, that idea of creating a kind of a sensory experience is always fundamental. So although we have to break things down and find very specific communi communication points, if there isn't kind of an emotional frequency there, then people will tune out and they won't want, you know, they won't watch this thing anyways. Um, the, I, rem I think I read the other day that the average attention span now is right, right around, hovering around eight seconds for an average person online. This is a tiny amount of time to get anybody's attention. So if we dive straight into all of the complexities and the nuts and bolts and the communication, we're gonna lose the audience almost instantly. Um, and so although we need to think through all of the communication strategy, we can't forget the emotional piece of the puzzle. And these, uh, these two projects, I, I, I've included them here. One of them uh, was for a technology company here based in Toronto called Ecobee. They make smart thermostats, amazing company. Um, and, uh, and then the other uh, for a, kind of a high-end television system uh, created by Vizio. And in both these cases, 
We needed to build a kind of a world within which these products could live and resonate, but more specifically within which that brand, that connected with the brand, and it was on the, on the right frequency for the brand. So I wanted to use this analogy from film, and I threw these names up here. Anyone here a film buff, loving film? I hope, yeah, everyone like, loves film. Uh, you know, when I think of these names, when I read these names, I, I kind of know what I'm, I don't know exactly, or we don't know exactly what we're gonna get, but we know the kind of experience we're going to have. We know that each of these creators creates a kind of a, a world and a mood and a place that we can go back and visit time and time again. Even though the context changes, even though the story changes, we know we're going to that place where we're gonna have that experience, that kind of an experience. And that's what we're trying to do with the work we're doing with brands. We're trying to create, uh, we're trying to find the voice of that brand and the mood of that brand. And then we're trying to create a place that is memorable where when that brand, when we see that brand, when we see that product, we know, we know something and feel something about the experience we're going to have. Well, I, I guess I'll share these films. Has anyone seen these two films? Maybe I'll play them in case I haven't been. That was Ecobee, the world of Ecobee. And here's, uh, here's Vizio, very different vibe. You know, it, it may look like, what the heck was going on there? <laughs> but there, there was, just like those other projects, there's a lot of deconstructed engineering background in there. The, the liquids and the, uh, that are activated by light, the backlighting, in the case of Ecobee, the responsiveness to the environment. It's all in there. It's all, it's all there, but you don't really need to get it. You, you get it, it'll be there. If, you know, people will dig deeper if you catch them. If you capture their heart, they'll dig deeper and they'll get the information. But if you don't capture the heart, then you're lost. Uh, I've heard this saying so many times and I'm not sure who said it. I tried to find who this is attributed to and I couldn't find it. That, I, I saw that and I didn't want to put it because it's apparently it was, yeah, she gets attributed to for a lot of things she didn't say. but. Uh, <laughs> I hope she did, that would be so amazing. Um, but it's so true, it's so true. So, you know, it's something <clears throat> constantly we, remi we remind ourselves about is, you know, we have our communication objectives, we have our, our nuts and bolts, but let's remember to make people feel something. And music is a huge part of that. So we work very collaboratively with composers and sound designers, some of them here in Toronto. and. Uh, and that is uh, also very intrinsic to our process. We, the, there, there's uh, you know, music is the, and, and sound is, is the most immediate way we can trigger an emotional response beyond using things like the uh, you know, emotional color cues that are universal, for example, and other things. 
So just the last little tidbit here on tools. There was um, some, it sounds like some others today had talked a little bit about Houdini, and that's something that has really um, transformed the work we do, the Ecobee project and Visio, and, uh, and, and also all that crazy, um, those reams of paper. Uh, that's all Houdini. And um, we do use a variety of different tools at the studio uh, for our creative work and our production management. But what is really exciting is the idea of kind of growing your own tools. And Stuart sort of hinted at a little bit of that with Houdini. Does anybody here currently work with Houdini or are familiar with, with side effects as a company? That's exciting. I, I highly recommend, uh, especially in, in the field of um, biomedical communication or any kind of um, visualization of science, it's, it's very exciting what it, what it offers. Um, I, pulled it, I wanted to pull a very, a very straightforward example. Stuart hinted at it. It's a node-based system, meaning that you're, um, you're connecting a series of nodes with wires one to another and processing data streams. The, um, the data, like most things with 3D, boils down to points in space. And so in Houdini, we take points in space and we manipulate them in various different ways. We attach different types of data to those points. We push them around, we triangulate them, we turn them into meshes, we do things with them, and we, we've, we manipulate that flow of data, and then we output it at the end of the day. And we've been using Houdini in conjunction with Cinema 4D very closely. They work very well together. We can create systems in Houdini that then we can feed into Cinema 4D and use. And um, these examples on this page were all created with one very, very simple, um, simple methodology called, um, called uh, you know, a shortest path algorithm. So here are the steps. I hope it's a little, a little bit small, but I'll just to walk through what's going on here. You, you, know, you have any kind of a mesh that you could start out with. It could be a sphere, it could be a triangulated plane, basically anything with polygons, edges, and points. We go and we select a couple points and define them as start points or seed points. Then, uh, so those two inner points are selected there. Then we select all uh, other points that could be just the points along the outer edge. It could be a few points in the middle. In this case, all of the points there are selected and those are our end points. We simply define those two groups, our seed points and our end points. And then we run an algorithm through Houdini, which is a, just a built-in um, algorithm. It's full of little predefined algorithms that if you unpack them are, are built out of really wonderful C code. And if you're not a gifted programmer, it's, a, it's an amazing way to take that shortcut and be able to do things but formally maybe only possible using C code. And uh, so this find shortest path algorithm simply finds the shortest path from those seed points to all those endpoints and traverses along the edges in order to find those paths. And by doing that simple thing, you end up with a very intricate, complex branching pattern that's totally directable. Directable because you're traversing along the edges. So by designing the edges within that mesh, you can create any pattern of branching imaginable. And then the beauty of that is that the algorithm in processing that edge traversal is able to give you back the value of the traversal along those edges. So now you have animated uh, branching. And then that you can then take and feed in and do anything you want with. So in this case, those, those source lines, those splines, they get meshed using something called um, VDB. It's a volume um, meshing. It basically, each of the, the points along those lines is defined with a scale value and those scale values accumulate. And so where there are more points accumulating, the branches are thicker, and where, the, the, you know, where there are fewer points, the branches are, are, are finer. And then we simply just smooth the entire surface, and it becomes this very beautiful organic uh, mesh in just literally a few steps with a few nodes. Houdini is amazing. And the company is based here in, in Toronto, has been around for 30 years, and the software is free. It couldn't be better. It's like a win-win for everybody. So I highly encourage everybody here uh, to delve into it. They, um, beyond you know, branching, uh, there, there are so many 
uh, generative and mathematically based tools we can use to infuse these kinds of lifelike complexities into the animation work we're doing. These are a few examples. A lot of these, you know, pulled out of those books that I showed at the very beginning. And these, the, the beauty of this is that these are so well documented and the knowledge is all open and available online to everybody. The scientific community is wonderful that way. It's all there for an, anyone to use and very, very collaborative. Um, and uh, I wanted to share these inspirations with you. They, uh, these, uh, you know, side effects is the company that makes the software. This resource is a resource for learning that's free and it's full of easy access to knowledge. And then these two incredible ladies are the most inspiring, in my opinion, people working in this field of generative uh, nature-inspired design in the world right now. And uh, Neri uh, Oxman is at the MIT Media Lab and is doing amazing things. There, she's, uh, I, I noticed on Netflix, there's a series called Abstract. Has anyone watched that? There's a great one that just centers around her and her work that just blew my mind completely. Um, and, uh, and then Jessica Rosencrantz, she uh, runs a, a studio called Nervous System Design. They develop products and designs and procedural uh, tools to do this kind of work. She often speaks at FITC too, so if anyone's in town for FITC. And, um, and then lastly, I just want to share a process reel from Ecobee that's full of that kind of stuff, uh, that procedural growth and algorithmic work inside of Houdini. that. Thank you so much, everybody. That's interesting. There, there are relationships, for sure, just like the ones inside the studio among artists. That's a really good point, in fact. Um, the, the work gets better when people get to know each other better and when the, you, know, you can really understand where the complementarities exist and where the strengths are. And uh, it works the same way with, with the sound and, and composition. You, you kind of get to know how to speak to each other and egos kind of fall away and the work can just flow. Yeah. I have a quick question, uh, Chris. Um, regarding story beats, this term, I'm wondering if you can define it a little bit more. Yeah. I guess it's, it's sort of like a precursor to storyboards that can be done in a very, um, in a very quick way by distilling down the the, ver the core communication points, so the very, very core framework communication points of, of a story. It can be a narrative. It can be something more of a technical narrative. But they're, they're the key communication points distilled down to their bare essence, basically, and then connected to some kind of visual reference. And it provides just enough of a, of a kicking off point for exploration to happen. So it's just defined enough, if that makes sense. It's not, it's not, you know, sometimes a storyboard can be super well defined and really, you know, maybe, um, it, it, if something's too well defined, other artists coming at it may feel like they don't, can't, they can't participate because it's been like, it's all been spelled out. So the story beats afford space. Is that the, the framework you talk about when someone is 
Absolutely. That's exactly it. Yeah, that's the framework. That's the scaffolding for um, that, that provides just enough of a box because you, you don't want a completely open box. There's nothing worse than an open brief. When a client says it's an open brief, it's actually the worst thing ever. No one wants an open brief. You need some guardrails, and if they don't exist, you need to define them on some level. Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. It varies so much. Um, some clients, they really want to get down and dirty and get in the weeds with you together. Uh, with, when, in the past, when we worked with Nike, they're really a, a whole bunch of designers and industrial designers over there. They have so much to say and, and share about the nitty gritty of like, the feel and the design. And, um, and in the case of Microsoft, it kind of varies. There, there are some individuals there that we work with who are very involved very deeply in the design, and others on the product side who know how it needs to be, but who kind of um, are there in the background more. So I'm not sure if that's answering the question very well, but the, it's suffice to say it varies quite a lot. Sometimes um, the client is happy to take a step back. Other times, they're happy to dive in. And we like it both ways. We like, we're very, we, we, we we love to be collaborative, and we love to have a client who, who cares about the work as much as we do, who wants to get in there and really get, you know, noodle around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know you've talked about giving your artists the freedom to explore and discover, and I imagine that takes quite a bit of time. So I'm sort of wondering what sort of time frame these projects typically take on. They um, never know. <laughs> <laughs> never know. But um, it, I mean, it, there, and there's tension there too. You know, there's, to be totally honest, and I think uh, one of our EPs is back there in the in the audience. And uh, you know, we 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 do have to, um, you know, we do have to find a sweet spot because there isn't. You're right. There's not infinite time. There never is. You know, for us or for anybody. But um, but we've learned that that if there, if you're going to put time anywhere, it's up front in that process, like it really does pay off. If you try to rush and put the cart before the horse, you, you just, you rob everybody of the possibilities. So by hook or by crook, we find some way to squeeze it in as much as we can. But we do work uh, very closely to define schedules and define, you know, sometimes a project's only like four weeks long. A lot of those projects kind of encompass like I guess our sweet spot is eight, we say like eight to 10 weeks, 12 is like, yay, you know, sometimes they're much longer, but generally speaking, they, they tend to kind of rest in the, I'd say between six to eight weeks to 10 at the upper end. Generally these days, it seems to have shrunk a lot over the years, to be honest, <laughs> just gets smaller. But, um, but we lay it out together, you know, we look, we say, okay, we definitely, we're gonna have that, if that's, if we only have a week, we're gonna really use every drop of that week and get as much a, as as we can out of that out of that R and D week, you know, as we can. But we never skip it. If we skip it, we we've done you know once or twice we've tried to circumvent it and it's always bit us back so hard and we really you know, yeah. So it's just um, trial and error, I guess we've learned. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's a really good question. That, that whole process is a little bit mysterious. It's great. No one, no one really talks about it that much. Even communicating with sound designers does take a certain... Um, it's tough because sound and music is very subjective. It's not easy to talk about in very objective terms. One trick we use is we, we do like a we draw a curve. It's sort of like the, 
the curve of um, the intensity of the flow of the piece that we want. But we always cut to a BPM. Sometimes our sound designer, that we, we, to answer your question, rewind us slightly, we, we definitely have our, our trusted collaborators and we're always trying to um, influence that process and have our clients work with the people we really love because we know they'll produce the best results. The, um, and uh, yeah, sometimes we'll get a, a, like a click track or a BPM to work with and, and having that means that things are sort of in the right tempo from, this, from the outset when we're cutting. But then, uh, but then it's definitely a process, and it, it, you know, the, the real sound comes together only when picture is closer to being fully realized, when the effects are in there, because sound design is a big part of that, and uh, can't happen unless there's enough visual there to work with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess I didn't really mention that, but definitely that's an interesting thing too. There is a hierarchy, they, in the set, um, but then there's a lot of openness as well, so it's kind of a bit of both. There's always uh, Alex and I, Creative Direct, and we're always there to provide guidance and vision. And we're very hands-on, we, we, you know, we love the work, we're artists ourselves, so, but we also don't want to get in the way, so we make sure we leave space. There, there are director, there's always a director on a project, and there's always an art director. Uh, it's very important to have art direction. Uh, and so the art director is there to kind of provide a filter for the work that's happening by, uh, uh, or being created by different artists. And when we build out those beats, they tend to kind of get broken out in by, uh, and uh, you know, tossed toward or tossed. I don't know, that doesn't sound very good, but like, you know, picked up by different artists. We usually have a kickoff meeting where that, uh, you know, that initial, the director, where the director and the art director have worked together to kind of define those basic story beats. And then at the kickoff meeting with the team, uh, everyone is open there to discuss and maybe some artists gravitate or have a vision for how they would approach that particular technical problem. Some, some you know, especially if a more technical artist or someone uh, may have more of an, you know, an inspiration and vision to, to try it, taking a crack at that. And so people naturally gravitate toward the areas they want to focus. But we meet every day in our dailies, and the, the dailies are where everyone has a voice. And even though there is you know, a director and there's a degree of hierarchy, it's, uh, ideas are always op a welcome from anybody. Anyone can have the, the best idea on the team. So it's, it's uh, it, and that's, uh, that's, that's something that we're, we're very conscious and careful of when we're building teams and when we're bringing people into the studio culture because we can't, there's no room for ego. There's no room for that, you know, my idea just because. That's the worst, most toxic thing that can happen inside of a team. So there's hierarchy, but there's also a lot of, you know, that collaboration thing is real. Like there, there has to be that flow and, and that, you know, even the director can accept a critique from an artist, on, you know, a junior artist on the team, or an idea from a junior artist on the team should be able to. That's that's important. Yeah. It's a constant battle. I'm in the weeds. You can ask Eval and Jill up there. <laughs> no, I, I'm trying to get, you know, I, I try to stay out of the weeds. I, ba I basically pick my weeds, but make sure that the artists have the better ones. And I'll take the crappy ones, but I still need a weed there, <laughs> you know, to dig into. And if there's, if there's, there's no room, then I go home and I just get in the weeds. <laughs> yeah. 
But I can't let go. I'm, I'm, the bug bit me I was, when I was five. I'm stuck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. I love you guys. Thank you.